And greetings, my friends, patriots, lovers of democracy, truth, and justice, believers in peace, freedom, and the American way. Tom Hartman here with you. Well, you know, yesterday I was talking about how, in my opinion, the Bush admin- or the Obama administration was basically using the same uh, rationale that Nixon had used going into Vietnam, saying we just need a decent interval. This morning, Mr. Gates uh, running around the news shows yesterday in his testimony, today in his testimony, actually. Uh, uh, he, well, I, actually, I guess it was yesterday. I'm reading from today's uh, Financial Times, saying, well, our withdrawal dates are flexible and like that. At the same time, we've got Don Rumsfeld, a man who I think is a war criminal, criticizing the President of the United States, President Obama, in his speech, in which he was asking for more troops, a speech which I disagreed with and a policy that I disagree with, but nonetheless, he's my president. And and here we have this, this, this weasel, Don Rumsfeld, criticizing him, saying, well, you know, how dare you say, you know, the uh, U.S. military never asked for more, more troops in, in, uh, or more aid in Afghanistan. Uh, during the seven years that we were having a war there. In fa- well, and in fact, then, um, you know, one of the generals goes before Congress, General McKiernan, and says, yeah, we did ask for aid, and we didn't get it. So, number one. And number two, you've got the vice president, the former vice president of the United States, Dick Cheney, another war criminal, saying, I think it's likely to give aid and comfort to the enemy. Obama's behavior. That's the definition of treason. Here we have the vice president of the United States. This is fascist talk. Now, last week, Louise and I were in Spain for the week, and we spent a couple of days in the Basque region. We spent uh, two days in Barcelona and a day in Madrid. I keynoted conferences in both Madrid and Barcelona, and we did some research in the Basque region about the uh, Montragon uh, cooperatives, which you know we'll talk about at some point in the future, and and I have to confess I didn't know a whole lot about Spanish history before I went there. Um, when when I lived in Germany, I learned a lot about German history. I learned a lot about World War II. Spain pretty much was absent from World War II. They had had the Spanish Civil War from as I recall thirty six to thirty nine, and Franco came to power and Franco allied himself with the Germans, but you know never really fought on their behalf and never really lost and never really was conquered and so a couple of the people the the two two of the people who were with me who went to madrid with me uh, one of them was the was one of the directors of the of the terra foundation one of the, the, the one of the groups that sponsored one of the talks that i keynoted and the other was my translator irene was her name um, after after my presentation in madrid we went to the museum to see Guernica, the painting by Pablo Picasso, that was done after what I was told. And, I don't, and this, you know, keep in mind, I, I am not an authority on Spain or the Spanish Civil War or any of this, but I was told it was one of the very first aerial bombardments, modern aerial bombardments of a civilian target purely for the purpose of inducing terror by Franco and his fascists during the Spanish Civil War. And Picasso produced this incredible painting, Guernica, which, uh, which was the name of the city that was bombed, about the civilians who died. And in this painting, the only people living are women who are sobbing. The men are, are dead. The, there's a, a broken sword. There's the, the, the horse with the... I mean, the symbolism of it's incredible. But... I asked a question. I asked. I asked uh, Irene, uh, my my translator. I said, uh, "Is there?" She said, "Is there anything you'd like to see while you're in Madrid?" And I said, "Yeah. Is there? You know, you had a period of fascism here in Spain, and uh, pretty much my extent of the knowledge of it is, you know, having seen Pan's Labyrinth. You know, the the, the movie uh, about the little girl who lived during the time of Franco. And, and you know, I have you know some some incidental incidental knowledge of Franco, but." I don't think most Americans know much about the Spanish Civil War or having, you know, read, uh, you know, Hemingway's, uh, I forget the title of it now, but, you know, when, when Hemingway got all inspired and said he's going to go over and fight with the Republicans, small R Republicans, the, the well, you know, for in, in favor of democracy against the fascists. And a lot of people did that. 
and ultimately they lost. So, and she told me the story of how her grandfather on one side was fighting for the Republicans, the good guy, you know, the good guys, and on the other side was fighting for the fascists, her grandfather, and they all had to get together for Christmas a couple of years ago, many years ago. And and I said, well, is you know, she said, is there anything you'd like to see? And I said, yeah, is there an equivalent of Yad Vashem? I've been to Yad Vashem in Israel, which is the Holocaust Museum in Israel, and and you walk through that the museum, and there's a kind of a mini version of it in in Washington D.C., which I haven't been to, but I've been to the one in Jerusalem at least three times, and uh, first time myself, the second couple times taking friends of mine there. And you cannot walk through that museum without uh, walking out the other end sobbing. I mean, it's just, it, it is one of the most intense emotional experiences that you can have. And, and so I said, is there an equivalent of Yad Vashem here that talks about the Franco years? Because I know in Germany, there are, you know, we, we, we took our kids to, to uh, several of the camps. There was, there was uh, Dachau down near Nuremberg, near where we lived. And we took our kids to Dachau. And and I remember when our when our youngest she was five years old and there were the ovens, and there were small ovens and there were the, the small you know where they took the ashes out and I remember our five year old saying is that the ovens for the little kids? And you know the kind of the innocence of the question and but the horror of the place really getting them, and getting us. And she said no, there isn't. That Franco actually died in his sleep in 1975 in Spain that the Spaniards have never dealt with the fact that this man, this, this dictator, this fascist dictator ruled their nation, tortured people, killed people, vanished people, stole their democracy, overthrew a democracy. And when Franco was fading, he appointed King Juan Carlos, who's still the king. And over the next year, in 76, Juan Carlos oversaw a transition to a constitutional monarchy, which is what they have now. But it's just an issue that's not discussed in Spain. At least this is what I'm what I learned from the Spaniards that I was talking about. And I want to share with you uh, after the break. I want to share a poem with you about the Spanish Revolution. But the reason why, and I and I want to set this in your mind right now. The reason why is and and why this comes back to the speech by Obama day before yesterday and the comments by by these proto-fascists and war criminals Dick Cheney and Don Rumsfeld are so important or are so relevant let's say to this conversation is that Spain is there's there actually is even now a resurgence of the fascist party in Spain Spain is has not dealt with their past and the United States has just finished a period of eight years of dealing with what I would characterize as a fascistic administration. An administration that, if by the Mussolini definition of fascism, the merger of corporate and state interests, you, we have more so-called contract, we have more mercenaries in Iraq than we do Americans, uh, American soldiers. Uh, you know, there's fascism there, the privatization of everything declaring wars on two nations that represented no threat to us and did nothing to us, uh, ignoring, apparently, the people who actually did something to us, and so on. And, and, and then using fear continuously, whether, whether it was the, you know, jacking up the terror alerts during the election of 2004, every time John Kerry got good press, and Tom Ridge has admitted this, that he was ordered to jack up the terror alerts for reasons that he couldn't understand. Using fear to terrorize a population, to have power. We have to come to terms with this in the United States, and the way that we have to come to terms with it is to prosecute the Bush administration. I want to share this poem with you right after this. So one of the things we learned is that in Barcelona and Madrid, all across Spain, there is no museum that uh, memorializes the horrors of the Franco-fascist years from 1939 to 1975. There's no, there's no, it's not, it's not, a, su it's not a subject for polite discussion. We were talking about it in a taxi in hushed tones. It's like you don't want to upset people. 
And it's the same kind of converse, it's the same kind of th situation that is happening right now in the United States about the crimes of the Bush administration. Cheney and Rumsfeld come out and they make these outrageous statements. Cheney calling the President of the United States, Barack Obama, uh, literally a traitor, saying he's giving aid and comfort to the enemy. That is the definition of treason. And nobody pointing out that he himself is a traitor. Pablo Neruda was arguably one of the most famous poets of the 20th century. He was uh, Chilean-born. He, uh, he worked on behalf of Chile. Uh, he was in Spain during the Spanish Civil War and lived in Spain for some time. Uh, went back, uh, back, to, back to Chile uh, when conservative president, Chilean President Gonzalez uh, Vadia outlawed communism in Chile. And Neruda was a communist. He wa they issued a warrant for his arrest. Friends hid him in a basement of their house. He later escaped uh, in exile into Argentina, uh, where he was a, a friend of uh, President Allende, who, as you know, uh, we took care of as well. He won the Nobel Prize, in fact, for his work. And this is a poem that he wrote about the Spanish Civil War. And I think that this, frankly, is a poem about the Bush years as well. It's called I'm Explaining a Few Things. You're going to ask, and where are the lilacs, and the poppy-petaled metaphysics, and the rain repeatedly spattering its words and drilling them full of apertures and birds? I'll tell you all the news. I lived in a suburb, a suburb of Madrid, with bells and clocks and trees. From there you could look out over Castile's dry face, a leather ocean. My house was called the House of Flowers because in every cranny geraniums burst. It was a good-looking house with its dogs and children. Remember Raul? Hey, Rafael. Federico, do you remember from under the ground my balconies on which the light of June drowned flowers in your mouth? Brother, my brother. Everything loud with big voices, the salt of merchandises, pile-ups of palpitating bread, the stalls of my suburb of our gaze with its statue like a drained inkwell in a swirl of hake. Oil flowed with, into spoons, a deep bane of feet and hands swelled in the streets. Meters, liters, the sharp measure of life, stacked up fish, the textures of roofs with the cold sun on which the weather vane falters, the fine frenzied ivory of potatoes, wave on wave of tomatoes rolling down the sea. And one morning, all that was burning. One morning, the bonfires leapt out of the earth, devouring human beings. And from then on, fire, gunpowder from then on. And from then on, blood. Bandits with planes and moors, bandits with finger rings and duchesses, bandits with black friars spattering blessings came through the sky to kill children. And the blood of children ran through the streets without fuss like children's blood. Jackals that the jackals would despise. Stones that the dry thistle would bite on and spit out. Vipers that the vipers would abominate. Face to face with you I have seen the blood of Spain tower like a tide to drown you in one wave of pride and knives. Treacherous generals, see my dead house. Look at broken Spain. From every house burning metal flows. Instead of flowers, from every socket of Spain. Spain emerges, and from every dead child, a rifle with eyes. And from every crime, bullets are born, which will one day find the bullseye of your hearts. And you'll ask, why doesn't his poetry speak of dreams and leaves and the great volcanoes of his native land? Come and see the blood in the streets. Come and see the blood in the streets. Come and see the blood in the streets. Pablo Neruda's poem. I'm explaining a few things. And that's the story of Afghanistan. We're sending some soldiers to Afghanistan.
That's the story of Iraq. Five million people in Iraq displaced. Between two and three million of them outside the country, a roughly equal number inside the country. In Syria now, the next country to the north of Iraq, the, the places of prostitution and strip clubs are filled with 12-year-old girls, Iraqis, working to survive. Jordan is filled with the wealthier refugees from Iraq. The dead are all over the country. Our use of, of uh, during the first Bush War and the second Bush War of depleted uranium is creating an explosion of, of the, some of the most horrifying birth defects ever seen. War crimes. We have committed war crimes in Iraq. We committed war, and, and frankly, it, to begin the bombing of Afghanistan was a war crime. To continue it is a war crime. And we, the United States, must confront the criminals. The Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld administration and the individuals in that administration with their crimes of war that led to the death of as many as a million people. And frankly, we as a people must do everything we can to stop the insanity, the ongoing insanity of these wars. Come and see the blood in the streets, writes Pablo Neruda. Come and see the blood in the streets.